This morning I received a something from Marlowe. Something he saw on Facebook. I still believe in amazing grace. That there is power in the blood. That he walks with me and talks with me. That because he lives, I can face tomorrow. All because of the old rugged cross. Music speaks. Just the titles remind us of the, the message of it. I do invite you to bow your heads with me as I surrender my heart and mind here again this morning. Dear Father in heaven, I still believe in amazing grace. Because of the old rugged cross, thank you. And Lord, may that grace never cease to amaze us. Because when we are rejoicing and in awe of you, we will find in you the, the comfort, the strength, the power, all that we need. And no matter what Satan throws at us, we'll remain firm on your foundation of amazing grace. Lord, as we continue to share in this series and I ask for your Holy Spirit to guide my thoughts, to send your angels of protection around this whole room, this whole church facility here, and that we might hear you speaking to us and blessing us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. The good news brings freedom is our sermon title for this particular one of Revelation 14. The good news brings freedom. Immaculate, growing up in Rwanda, was a peaceful place. There was no tension. I, friends and people fellowship together. The Hootsies and Tootsies, they didn't seem to have any problem. There had been some tension in the past, but growing up she didn't sense any. Until she got into her middle teens. Then there was some things happening amongst the Hootsies, stirring up some things. In fact, there was a radio program. People, she said, they kind of acted like they were drunk, but things, saying things jokingly like, Boy, we should kill the Tutsis. Strange. Then one day she saw, uh, off in a distance, someone actually taking a machete and killing someone. But that was off in a distance. That didn't happen often. But then in 1994, when the plane went down with the leader of the country on it, it led to an excuse on the part of Hootsies to kill the other tribe, the Tutsis. Threats were made. Join in killing or you will be killed. Her father told Immaculate, go to such and such a person's house, a pastor, a hootsi, a priest. Go to him. Say that I sent you to him. It was about three miles away. She went. She didn't want to go. She didn't want to leave her family. But, but out of obedience, she did, not knowing what would happen. And the killing began. She got to the home of this 
family friend. He was willing to put her into a bathroom. It was a bathroom that was, was not in a major, it was actually off of one bedroom. So it wasn't a common place to go. It was a, a bathroom three feet by four feet. Six other women were also placed in that bathroom. And when they were in there, as you can imagine, they were scrunched up together. Willing to do it, knowing what was outside. Some people had seen women go in. And so Hootsies came and searched the house. Immaculate is scared to death. The first time they searched, you know, no one came in that area. And, and oh, she was relieved. But that wasn't the first time, the, or the la, and that wasn't the last time. And she wondered when they would come in, what would they do to her? How would they kill her? Fear. What's happening to her family? Will she ever see her family again? The fear arose greatly as she hears them coming into the house again. And she prays, God, if today they don't open this door, I can promise you I'm going to try to know who you are. They came searching. They came into the bedroom. The person grabbed a hold of the knob into the bathroom. Five inches separating them from death. And then the person left. that awakened in her mind uh, there is a personal God. There is a God out there. Led her on a search. For 90 days, they hide in this bathroom. After the killing is over, she finds all of her family have been killed. She's 18. A Catholic in search of God. Struggling with anger, with hatred towards people who were doing such atrocities across the land. Praying. The only way she knows how. The Lord's Prayer. The Rosary. Praying. And she wanted to skip over that part. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. But the Lord was working on her mind and heart. And she began to think about them who had done the killing and what they must be going through. And in her praying, she began to surrender and choose to forgive. Forgiving the men who killed my parents and brothers was a process, a journey into deeper and deeper prayers that brought freedom to her heart, her mind, not having to live with what she was 
living with. In that bathroom, she was thinking about what I'm going to do to get back at them. I'm going to kill them. Freedom from hatred, from bitterness, from revenge. The good news brings freedom. No matter what background we're in. And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach. Why is it necessary to preach the gospel? Many think that that's common knowledge. Everybody knows that. But apparently God doesn't know that. Everybody knows that. He says, this is the passion of my heart to go to all the world because of what it can do in people's lives. Bring healing, reconciliation, forgiveness, joy, Heaven coming down into our hearts. The everlasting gospel to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying in response to the gospel, fear God, awe in awe of Him, worship Him, give Him glory. And another angel followed saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, because he has, she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Who is Babylon? Who is Babylon? Why has she fallen? What has she fallen from? So three words I'd like us to focus on here. What is she making the nations drink? And what does it mean? The wine of the wrath of her fornication. I'd like to start with the last one, the fornication. As we seek to understand who Babylon is, Revelation 17 helps us to understand then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So notice, fornication with the kings of the earth. Adultery with the kings of the earth. So that gives us a clue. We'll come back. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which is full of names of blasphemy. Blasphemy. The literal meaning of the Greek word translated blasphemy means to misrepresent. So when Jesus was accused of blasphemy, when he had the ability to, to forgive, they said, you're misrepresenting God because no human can take God's place. They weren't able to accept him as being God. You're misrepresenting God. Full of names of misrepresenting God. God, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Full of abominations, wickedness of all kinds. And on her forehead, a name was written, Mystery, 
Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. This is her name. Written on her forehead that John could see. But it's a mystery, so it's kept hidden. It's, it's not the thing that's outwardly visible to everyone that this is what she's like. But the revelation from God reveals what she's like. I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement of what's happening, of this horrible picture of God's people being murdered by this power. Some artist describing, depicting it this way, seven heads, ten horns, a little earlier in Revelation, Revelation 12, we see a picture described of Satan. Do you remember what he looks like in the first part of Revelation 12? A dragon. How many heads? You remember? Seven heads. Ten horns and crowns on the horns. Satan, behind the scenes, the real king, behind the rulers of the world, working his will. Here we see no crowns. And in Revelation 17, a little bit later, the, the kings, the ten kings that will receive crowns for one hour, with the beast. This is future. The last part of earth's history. Satan doing his final battle against God's people. The woman sitting on the beast. A harlot. Fornication with the kings of the earth. The political power. What's the woman represent? Well, we can get an idea much more clearly when we see how God spoke in the Old Testament. When he talked about Israel and Judah. Going back to Jeremiah 2, verse 13. For my people have committed two evils. Only two. That's pretty, that's not very many but it encompasses everything. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, the source of life, and hewn themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. People do the same today. Forsaking Jesus, looking for satisfaction, looking for meaning, looking for fun, excitement, and all kinds of things that do not bring meaning in life. Do not bring the joy, the peace, the love. Jesus could say that same thing today to many, many, many people. May it not be said of us. In the context here, dropping down to verse 18, he says this, And now why take the road to Egypt to drink the waters of Sihor? Or to, why take the road to Assyria to drink the waters of the river, the river Euphrates? Why are you trusting in these nations to help you and protect you? They had forsaken him. They had gone on, gone after other gods. Worship the gods of the other nations. So they had a, an, an affinity with them. And, and so when there was trouble in the land, they go, will you help us? And notice how God describes that. 
Your own wickedness will correct you. Your backslidings will rebuke you. That's what oftentimes God does. He allows our consequences to be our discipline and our rebuke. That we might see our need to walk his way, to receive his help. Know therefore and see that it is an evil and bitter thing that you have forsaken the Lord your God. And the fear of me is not in you, says the Lord of God of hosts. Then dropping down to chapter 3. For all the causes for which backsliding Israel had committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a certificate of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah did not fear, but went and played the harlot also. About a hundred years before Judah went into uh, captivity in Babylon, Israel, the northern kingdom, had taken, been taken captive by Assyria and been spread throughout the earth. And they were never brought back. So you had originally the 12 tribes. Then 10 tribes went with the north after Solomon's reign was very heavy because of his own sin. And then his son made it even heavier and they... They separated, just as God said would happen. Ten tribes to the north. How many tribes to the south? We think of two because there's 12 total, but one. Because the Levites were the 12th tribe that were mingled without, throughout. Because they were the priests were not given land. So Judah was the southern tribe, which is... This is just a little side note, which is why we call them the Jews. Judah, Jews for short. Um, the harlot. God's people, their mission was to go to the world to invite them to experience the God who had become their God. Exodus 19 Five and six. You are my special people. I've chosen you. Above all people, for all the earth is mine. You are to be a kingdom of treasure. You are to be a, a kingdom of priests. A mission. All the people are mine. You are to bring us together. Their mission. And God worked his wonders. They flourished in Egypt. Egypt. Then were rescued out of Egypt, brought into Canaan, grew, prospered under the kingdom of David and Solomon. At that time, the greatest nation on earth. Solomon's prayer was so wonderful at the beginning. If only had he had remained humble, teachable, surrendered. When people came to him, the opportunity to do what Israel was called to do, to be a priest, a kingdom of priests, to share what God is like. He had done it. He had brought them to this place. Pride, riches, and power corrupted. Immorality had corrupted Solomon. And Israel went downhill from there. And God describes them as a harlot. And so when we come to Babylon, who is Babylon? In the New Testament, the church that is trusting in the kings of the earth rather than God, trusting in human power, rather than God. Babylon is a, is a mother of harlots, leading people to trust kings, leading people to trust human power rather than God. When that happens, is there going to be problems? Absolutely. Because if you're trusting in yourself, trusting in human power, trusting in political power, 
There is no political human power that can change the heart. And so abominations skyrocket. Abominations flourish. Making it acceptable so that we don't feel guilt. Drunk with the blood of the saints. Romans 1.16 Who has Babylon fallen from? From the gospel. What has Babylon fallen from? I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God unto salvation. That's the power to change the life. And if I've turned away from the power of the gospel, I have no power to offer people. 1 Corinthians 1.18, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, but know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power, forsaking the gospel, leads to looking for some other substitute power. having a form of godliness, the church, looking good on the outside, but desperately evil on the inside. From such people, the last line says, from such people, turn away. Kind of, kind of reminds me of what Revelation says. Come out of her, my people. Come out of her. Babylon has fallen from the gospel. Babylon is Christianity that rejects the everlasting cost, the gospel as the power of God. Any form of Christianity that has moved away from the gospel is part of Babylon. For in the, in the final analysis, there's only two groups in this last period that John talks about, that God reveals in Revelation. Two groups. The one group following Jesus, the Lamb of God. Wherever he goes, Revelation 14, 4 says, following the Lamb, wherever he goes. Having the seal of the Father written on their forehead. The character of the Father. They, they become one with him. The fruit of the Spirit coming out of their lives because that's what God does as Andrea spoke last night, last week. Christ in you, the hope of glory. The hope of the giving glory to God through a character that reflects His. The Spirit filling us, baptizing us for ministry. One group living with God. Keeping the commandments of God. Holding on to the faith of Jesus and the testimony of Jesus. The Word of God and, and all that the Holy Spirit presents. The other group. So, so here you have one group following the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. The Father, the Lamb, the Holy Spirit. The other group following another trinity. The dragon the beast, and the false prophet. The parallels between those two are more than coincidental. God gave power to Jesus. 
the dragon gives power to the beast. Jesus leads people to back to worship God. The beast leads people back to worship the dragon. The Holy Spirit leads people to focus on Jesus, the, the lamb-like false prophet leads people to worship the beast and the image to the beast that's created at the last hour of earth's history. Not a coincidence of that counterfeit. And Satan will bring about the pressure, the manipulation, making all nations drink of the wine of this fornication of Christianity uniting with the kings of the earth to force people, you have to make a decision. Which group are you going to be in? If you don't follow us, we'll kill you. The Hootsies and Tootsies, just a, just a, a miniature picture of what Satan has in store. Christianity. The false prophet. Looks like a lamb. Looks like a lamb. Looks outwardly Christianity, Jesus. But inwardly speaks for Satan. False prophet. Babylon has fallen when it rejects the gospel as the foundation of life, the source of power. God's saving us from every aspect of the sin problem, the security in Christ, the salvation from slavery to sin, and the desire to be one with God now and forever. The, all the evil effects being, being removed. Without the everlasting gospel, abomination multiplies. Evil is considered good. Reinterpreting the word of God. so they can feel good about themselves, so they can find security from a human standpoint. Reinterpreting the Bible. Godliness is hated, saints are persecuted. A little, little chart here. Three common views of salvation. In the Roman Catholic perspective, this is their official teaching, only people who receive the sacraments are justified by grace. They talk about justified by grace through faith. They use that phraseology. But as you study more into what they're thinking, for them, the only way you get the grace is by participating in the sacraments from the priest. So there's salvation only through the church. The law of the church reigns in essence, more important than even the Bible. The Council of Trent was brought together for the express purpose of asking the question, what do we do with the Protestant Reformation cry, the Bible and the Bible alone is our rule for what to believe and how to live? What do we do with that? People were joining the, the Reformation. They needed a response. And after 13 years of meeting, I'm sure there was other things they, they dealt with, but, but that was one of the primary. Periodically meeting, they come to the conclusion, no, the Bible is not a sufficient guide. One of the reasons they gave is because the Sabbath is Saturday in the Bible. And all of Christendom practices Sunday. Not all. They were aware of Sabbath keepers. 
And so they mentioned, if you were going to follow the Bible and the Bible only, then as Protestants, you should go back to the Seventh-day Sabbath as Sabbatarians. That was their official response in the Council of Trent. They chose that the Bible wasn't the official guide. Rejecting the gospel. Fallen from the gospel. Legalism is the official experience of that teaching. Calvinism. Only the elect are justified by grace. The law was fulfilled by Christ. It is no longer binding. No longer binding for the Christian. There's the dispensation for the Jews and dispensation for the church. And so the word down here at the bottom is lawlessness that's not on the screen. Arminianism. Only believers are justified by grace. Only believers are justified by grace. Now, part of this discussion between the Arminian and Calvinism was over what was accomplished by Jesus' death. And the Calvinists said, Jesus took the initiative to die for the sins of the world, to qualify them for eternity. No, to die for the sins of the elect, to qualify them for heaven. And he will make sure they respond in faith Limited atonement. The reason they teach that is because if people die at the end for their sins, but they were already paid for by Jesus, then those sins would be paid for twice. That would be unjust. And so Jesus died for the elect. Arminian responds, no, Jesus died for all. But knowing that the Bible doesn't teach universalism, that everyone will go to heaven, wrestling with what we do to that, well, he died for all, but it's not effective for anyone. It's, uh, Jesus didn't really qualify everyone for heaven. He, only believers are justified. what that leads to. And I mentioned this two weeks ago. So just a little review. If you believe and then are justified, then well, other things are tied to faith. If you really believe, then you should be baptized. Then you're really not justified until you're baptized. If you really believed... You should keep the Sabbath because Sabbath is an expression of faith. So you're really not justified until you keep the Sabbath. If you really believe, you would tithe 10% and offerings. Because tithing is an expression of faith. So you're really not justified until you tithe. And so the effect of that is legalism. It's legalism. We have typically been in the Arminian camp. Now, what we're talking about here is this one here, because that's the one that's been so misunderstood going on. I'm going to read some verses here that emphasize what Jesus did for everyone. John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Everyone. 
He bore the sin of all. All have sinned. All fall short of the glory of God. All being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. There's no other way you can understand that to be anybody but all in the context of that passage. He accomplishes this for everyone so that everyone has the freedom of choice. And remember, just a, a review from two weeks ago. He did this for all so that God could be just when forgiving us, qualify us for heaven, and restore our freedom of choice. Okay? Those who embrace Jesus as their Savior, the Holy Spirit comes in and transforms them so that they now can bring glory to God, be a blessing to others, and enjoy the presence of God. Okay? So people are lost, not because Jesus didn't qualify us for heaven, didn't, didn't earn that for us. It's because people love darkness rather than light. Going on. Romans 5.18, Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. What Adam brought to everyone. Condemnation. We're born condemned. And if that was the end of the story, there is no hope. But Jesus, as the last Adam, also represents the human race. So through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life to all men. 1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for how many? For all. Jesus Christ is the propitiation, the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Understanding what he accomplished for the human race is the foundation that had been lost and missing. All of those verses come together in this, for the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died in Christ, the death that is the wages of sin. And that's why God can say this in verse 19, or verse 15, and he died for all that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Our motivation changes. Verse 19, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Every human being, not imputing their trespasses, not counting their trespasses to them, because in Christ we did die the death that is the wages of sin. And so the focus is now reconciliation, bringing people back. God's removed the sin barrier. So we're free to come to him just as we are. Verse 21, for he made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. He becomes one with us, takes our sin upon him and us and takes us to the cross that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Legalism and lawlessness, what Satan is trying to get us in on both camps. The everlasting gospel keeps us in the center. Charles Hodge wrote these three books back in 1872. They were published. Uh, a Calvinist, teacher at Princeton Seminary. His, he was born in 1776. His parents were married in 1790. Had children, three children to begin with. In, in 1793 and 1795, those first three died of a, a plague of scarlet fever that went through. Then another son was born, Hugh, and then Charles. Hugh became a doctor, Charles became a a teacher. In the book, he wrote something I was going to put that on the screen, but I didn't. Sorry about that.
вот. In the book, he has this hint. And, and, and part of his thinking is wrestling with Romans 5.18, which we read a little bit ago. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. He's wrestling with babies who have died. His three siblings. And he says this. All the descendants of Adam, except Christ, are under condemnation. All the descendants of Adam, except those of whom it is expressly revealed that they cannot inherit the kingdom of God, are saved. All are saved, except who the Bible says are lost. And who does the Bible say are lost? Those who love sin. Those who love darkness. Those who don't want to live with God, they cry out, hide me from the face of him who sits on the throne. Neil Punt, in the 19... 70s, reads that, also a Calvinist, reads that, and it, it leads him to, to ponder and see salvation from, from a different perspective, reviewing the plan of salvation from that standpoint. All have been saved. But yet, there will be those who are lost because they reject. God, trying to bring back that everlasting gospel. 1870s, that little hint, God is working. W.W. W. Prescott attends some meetings in 1888, doesn't think too much of it kind of resists and wrestles against it. Meetings that, that Ellen White describes being there as a message sent from heaven. A message where God was beginning to pour out the latter rain. The latter rain, the Holy Spirit. What's the Holy Spirit do first? Leads into truth. And then gives the power to share. But Satan was there too. The spirit of fear. That the good news was just too good to be true. And wrestling against it. And Prescott was on that camp. Several years later, after hearing more, after reading more of what Ellen White said about it, and one day sitting in a meeting where Ellen White was speaking, she gets done. He stands up to speak. Prescott. An amazing organizer, an educator, founding Walla Walla University, founding Union College, founding Andrews University. At one time, the president of all three of them at the same time. He stands up to speak. And he can't. He starts to weep. As he catches a glimpse, as he's been wrestling with that message of what Jesus did for the human race. And he said, I confess, I've been fighting against it, but I realize the truth and I surrender.
He spoke it in 18, so that was 18, early 1890s when that happened. In 1895, he goes over to Australia. And he participates in a, a series of camp meetings or evangelistic series meetings and gives a series of eight sermons. This book uh, has those eight sermons. In that, he says this, Every one of us was represented in Jesus Christ when the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We were all there in Jesus Christ. We were all represented in Adam after the flesh. And when Christ came as the second Adam, He stepped into the place of the first Adam. And thus, we are all represented in Him. By joining Himself to us by birth, all humanity was brought together in the divine head, Jesus Christ. He suffered on the cross. Then it was the whole family in Jesus Christ that was crucified. The wages of sin is death, and in Christ we died. And so God can be just when forgiving us. Without the law being done away with. And it can empower the person who responds with the Holy Spirit to enable them to experience the righteousness of the life of Christ lived out in them. He continues straight on. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then all died. What we want in our experience is to enter into the fact that we did die in Him. The truth as it is in Christ. In 1994, when I first became aware of this sermon, I'd already been become aware of this gospel foundation. I was also aware of the fight against it. One magazine called Our Firm Foundation spent two whole issues in March and April of 1994 criticizing and tearing apart a book that Jack Sequeira wrote called Beyond Belief where he shares this message. The April issue of that very year Say, the very next month, this sermon was printed in that same magazine. I couldn't believe it. What's going on here? They spent two whole issues criticizing and then print the very foundation of what that book is about. I called him up. I'm puzzled. Can you help me understand this, this dilemma? You criticize and then you promote the same message. The person I talked to was not one of the leaders. He tried to express, no, it's different. It's different. And, and we talked some more and I, I asked him, did you ever read that book, Beyond Belief? No. But I've heard people talk about it. In other words, you can take a book, and you can take pieces here, pieces there, out of context, and you can, you can criticize just like you can the Bible. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach to them who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. That gospel, the one Paul preached, the one that says 
the love of Christ compels us, motivated by love, because one died for all, therefore all died. Therefore, he has saved the world from the wages of sin, qualifying every human being for eternal life. That gospel will go to all the world. Counterfeit gospels will also be shared. And there will be two groups. One that rejects the foundation of the everlasting gospel that leads to legalism and lawlessness, which leads to abominations of every kind, which leads to powerlessness to change lives, which leads to relying upon the kings of the earth and political laws to try to keep evil in check, which leads to anger towards those who share the everlasting gospel, which leads to a threat. You will not be able to buy or sell if you don't give up the everlasting gospel and come follow us. But because the everlasting gospel leads us to be motivated by love, those threats mean nothing. Because we find our security and strength in Jesus and Jesus alone. And under his wings, we will find our shelter. Jesus wept as he cried to Jerusalem, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I wanted to gather you as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. And now your house is left unto you desolate. They were rejecting the gospel. But he didn't give up on them. He prays on the cross, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. God bears long. And so he says a message in Revelation 18. Babylon has fallen, has fallen. The organizations that officially reject, but the people in them Come out. Come out of that foundation that's on sand. Come out and be separate and rest in me. Trust in me. Let me live in you. That sing, that song under his wings. I am safely abiding with Christ, with security in him. We will. Let's stand together for prayer. I, I said prayer. Let's stand together to sing. And since it's, I just looked at the clock, that clock, uh, we need to fix it so I can be reminded the time is a little bit later. Let's just sing the first stanza. Bye. 
your Father in heaven, you experience the horrendous pain watching Jesus be rejected, ridiculed, attacked. And you step back knowing there was only one way for us to have hope is for Jesus to take the sin of the world upon himself and to take us to the cross. Thank you for loving us so much that you gave your son. The fight, the battle that started in heaven is raging on this earth. Abominations have so increased. Evil is being called good and good evil. We know we're at the, the very end of time and earth's history. And Lord, you have good news to share. You have good news that can bring peace and freedom and victory. Lord, may we be rooted and grounded in that good news and bring that to others. May your Holy Spirit be poured out into our lives to, to help us be rooted and grounded in that so nothing can shake us. So that when you empower us to share, Satan's threats will have no effect. I thank you, Lord, that you will do all of that. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.